AMD have released their new Zen 2 processors into the wild, Threadripper. Seven nanometers and up to 32 cores at the moment with the 3970X. And with that brings a forced update to the TRX40 motherboards. And so you can't use an X399 motherboard with these new CPUs, even though the socket is actually identical, but they've changed the pin layouts. And if you wanna know the differences between X399 motherboards and TRX40s and the nitty gritties, I'll put a link to a video that I previously did up here. But what we've got here on the table is two, and I do say this with a funny sort of quotations, entry level TRX40 motherboards, in that they're actually the cheapest uh, TRX40 motherboards on at the market. We've got the ASRock Creator TRX40. And this is coming in at 460 USD roughly, and that's the prices I can see it for. And then in Australia, it's coming at 799 Aussie dollars. Then besides that, we've got the uh, TRX40 Aorus Master, which is coming in at 500 USD. So it's about $50 more expensive. And then in Australia, it's actually coming in cheaper at 729 Aussie dollars. So it's a weird pricing thing here, but basically the Aorus Master in uh, triple P terms is better value in Australia than the TRX40 creator is. So I'd like to see sort of ASRock try and get their pricing down for Aussies. But with that aside, let's take these motherboards through all the paces. And one particular interesting thing is the update to the audio on board on these motherboards where they're now going through the USB to instead of going through directly to the CPU with the audio codec. So they've both got Realtek 1220s on board. However, Aorus has used the ESS uh, saver DAC on the front panel out. We will talk about that soon. But also you'll notice on the boxes that they've got Realtek 4050 printed on pretty much all these uh, new motherboards from the TRX40 lineup. And what that means is that they've pretty much, I believe they've all collaborated together and they've all gone to Realtek and they've said, look, can you just design a bridge chip for us that will work? And so how this works is we've then got the codec, which is a 1220, for example. It goes through what's called I squared S, which was designed from Philips back in 1986, and it's since been updated and whatnot. And then that goes to the USB 2, and then that translates to the CPU via that method. And so you do need this extra chip on board. So don't get confused about the 4050. But speaking of that, why I think they collaborated on the onboard audio is because these two solutions on the rear output are literally identical in their onboard audio. And we'll go through those numbers quickly. What we had from zero to 10 Hertz, a DB drop off of 2.5. And then from there, it was basically perfectly flat all the way up to about 6K where there was a 0.1 DB drop off. So the onboard audio in terms of output for headphones, it's gonna do a good job of powering pretty much anything up to mid-range standard. The amplification isn't there for things like orthodynamics. And we look at the crosstalk on max volume, there's no leakage, it's about minus 80 dB, which means that the crosstalk is decent, certainly not the best I have seen from motherboard manufacturers. I have seen as low as minus 90 dB, I believe. So maybe that bridge is playing a role there and not giving you the best crosstalk numbers. And this was at a volume level of 100. However, one thing about the ESS Sabre DAC on the Aorus Master is that it's giving out some pretty bad numbers. When I tested this, even at a volume level of 50, it started to get really shaky after about 1.5K. And when you put the volume level at 100, you, it just lost the plot. So I'd like to see them uh, maybe improve the implementation of this ESS Sabre DAC. And this goes back to onboard audio and other components on pretty much any device. You can have the best componentry, but if it hasn't been implemented properly, then unfortunately it's not going to work the way that at least ESS intended it to work in this case. So onboard audio in terms of the rear output is good. The mic input, if you're looking to use this, say for streaming or for games, it doesn't have any noise suppression, but it does start to introduce noise after about 20 decibels, 100 volume level. So leaving it at plus 20 dB, 50 volume level, is gonna be great for input. Though I will state one thing, if you are serious about audio, I would go out and get a separate DAC amp solution or especially an amp solution if you wanted to power high powered headphones. Though the last thing that struck my curiosity with these motherboards and their new implementation of communicating to the CPU with that Realtek 4050 was whether there was any delay in the sound output versus say the X299 motherboard that I have here. And so running the test and doing basically a reverb test where I'd have the mic basically input back from the sound output by clicking my fingers really hard, we saw that there was virtually no delays between TRX40 
and also X299. If I had to measure it down to milliseconds, it was like roughly 117 milliseconds versus 125 on the TRX40. So basically if you're gaming with mid-range cans on these boards, which again, I don't recommend buying these for gaming, there's much better choices out there, then you will have a decent experience, at least from the rear panel outputs of both these motherboards. With that aside, let's roll the intro and then finally get into the juicy VRM details for you guys. Welcome back to Tech Yes City and what we've got here on both these motherboards, let's run through the juicy details. 240 gram heat sinks on both solutions with the ASRock having an active fan. And then moving on into the MOSFETs, we've got a 16 plus three uh, power stage design on the Aorus Master and that's from Infineon mainly where they're using 70 amp with no doublers, the TDA21472 power stages. And then for the PWM controller, they're using the G5C. Then for the chokes, we've got Magic 70 amp chokes. And then for caps, we've got FP12K Nichicon black capacitors. Though, what about ASRock's side of the fence? Their PWM controller is the Intersil 69247. And then for the MOSFETs, they've got eight power stages using 90 amp Intersil ISL 99390. And then for the chokes, they've got Magic 90 amp on that side of things. So for the capacitors, ASRock say they're using FP12K Nichicon black capacitors, but these for some reason don't look like your typical FP12K caps. They actually look like tantalum capacitors, which you see on extremely high-end VRMs, the best of the best. So it's great that they're using them. I just don't know why on the spec sheet they've uh, said they're FP12K. So breaking this down, you're probably thinking, wow, the Aorus has 16 phases. The uh, ASRock only has eight. And after doing my test, I'm going to say this is an example of where more isn't necessarily better. And of course, this max capacity is like, I believe around 1330 amps versus 730 on the ASRock. But again, both these are plenty fine for a 3970X and a 3960X, where they do TDP out at 285 watts. And that's both on the CPUs that I've had come through here. However, stress testing these in the real world shows that Zen 2 Precision Boost Overdrive is a really good sweet spot for getting uh, a workstation working stable, as well as keeping the heat and power consumption down, making sure everything runs fine. I really do like what AMD are doing with PBO2 uh, in their Zen 2 lineup. I think it's phenomenal on all their CPUs to the point where after I tested my initial Zen 2 CPUs, I didn't bother overclocking because the diminishing returns was huge versus what PBO2 was doing. So they've done a phenomenal job there. And I think on workstations, it's even more important to get your efficiency right, especially for the long term and keeping heat down. Now we are in a 27 degree ambient environment. And what we're seeing here is 437 watts from the wall versus 465 watts from the wall in the Aorus, where it's using more phases and so it's switching more and it's not as efficient. And here's the thing with the active cooling solution on the ASRock board. We saw a maximum VRM temperature of 70 degrees and then 51 degrees on the heatsink, as opposed to the Aorus where we saw a maximum temperature of 81 degrees on the PCB versus 62 degrees on the heatsink. So ASRock's solution of the fans not only made that it was more efficient, but it was also giving out lower temperatures. And I did see this on the 3900X that I tested on their mini ITX motherboard, where it was extremely efficient. And that was one of my favorite X570 boards. So I like that ASRock's going with this whole lean, but keep it mean approach with their TRX40 motherboard as well. But continuing on with these motherboards, both of them use two Oz Cosper and have eight layer designs. ASRock says theirs is a server grade implementation, which is great to see. And then we've got eight SATA port outs on both boards, as well as three 4X PCIe Gen 4 NVMe uh, support lanes. And then for the actual PCIe 16 speed slots, they've both gone with four full slots. However, two of those are only X8 and the other two are X16 PCIe Gen 4. Now I have heard that there are motherboards out there that do have three uh, full X16 slots. So if you're after that, then both these motherboards aren't going to be your choice. Now in terms of input output connectivity on the motherboards themselves, we've got a single uh, type C out on both these boards. We've got a 90 degree angled 24 pin on the Aorus board, which is also an extended ATX design as opposed to the TRX40, which is a standard, uh, the creator, a standard ATX design. 
Now the creator also has a PCIe 6 pin input for power. So if you're going with the uh, SLIs, four of those cards, you may need that to supply additional power. The Aorus board doesn't have that, but they both have two eight pin power ins for getting extra power to the CPU, especially if you're overclocking. And then moving down, you've got a power and reset button on both these boards. Uh, the Aorus actually features it at the top, as well as both having BIOS debug readout LEDs. And then lastly, for connectivity on rear input output, we've both got 5.1 manual surround out, as well as SPDIF, optical outs, Wi-Fi 6, dual NICs, and uh, on the Aorus, we've got seven USB ports plus an extra type C connector, so eight in total, as well as both having BIOS flashback and clear CMOS. Now there's no PS2 port on the Aorus Master and the ASRock does have that, but it does lose a USB port because of that. So you're looking at six plus the additional Type-C for seven in total on the TRX-40 versus the eight on the Aorus. Now speaking of my good friend Nick, or in this case, we've got four of them, so that makes them Nick's. We've got here a 5G Aquantia a solution on the Aorus plus a 1GB Intel. And the funny thing was when I tried to install the drivers, I couldn't get it to work. So it looks like Aorus have to update their website to include the 5GBE driver properly because I couldn't get it on Windows Search and it wouldn't download and install properly. So I couldn't actually test the speeds on that. But I did test the USB uh, 3.2 speeds and they were blazingly fast. And if you blinked, you would have missed the transfers that were that quick on both boards. Uh, Wi-Fi 6 speeds were fine. And also the ASRock has the Aquantia 10G solution, which I tested out and that was working. And that was giving us out some really quick numbers. So everything was checking out on these boards except that driver download which I'm sure Aorus will fix very soon. Now speaking of TRX40 chipsets and fan cooling with the PCIe Gen 4, they've upgraded to 50mm fans on both. They do a great job of keeping noise down even while I was testing out the PCIe Gen 4 temperatures and I'll give you guys a quick listen to the noise. The graphics card fans are pretty much overpowering the chipset fans, so they've done a great job of keeping temperatures low on both chipsets. Well, I'll pull up the numbers for you guys, as well as the M.2 PCIe Gen 4 two terabyte test that I did where I was continually spamming the 10 gigabyte test. The ASRock did perform a little bit better than the uh, Aorus in the tests, but that's really negligible because Pretty much the temperatures on both these chipsets and also the M.2 heat sinks are absolutely fine. It's not worth uh, writing home about. But another thing too with the VRM heatsink active cooling fan on the ASRock TRX40 Creator, it was very quiet too. It was pretty much um, getting overpowered by everything else in the pipeline. And then moving over to the Aorus Master, that actually has a fan up north. It's just hidden away behind the input output shield. And so this little fan will exhaust heat out of the input output shield and will do so again whilst remaining quiet. I think both the motherboard manufacturers in today's comparison have prioritized the chipset fans and how they sound. That is one thing, you're getting good cooling as well as good noise. Now with all that out of the way, I will quickly say that the BIOSes on both these are very intricate. Aorus have finally stepped it up in the last year and made a really good BIOS, so kudos to them. ASRock have had a very good BIOS for quite a number of years now, so there's no real um, reason to get one over the other for the BIOS functionality. Though, that being said, now we're coming to a recommendation where which one should you buy? And this is actually a really good uh, thing with both these boards because they both offer something different. For me personally, if I was in the market for Zen 2, knowing what I know after trying out both these boards, I'd be getting the TRX40 Creator. And that's because I've got 10G uh, wired at my studio now, and this has a 10GB NIC on board, plus it has a more efficient VRM for cooling the 3960X and 3970X, at least from the testing I've done here today. So what you've got here now is a trade-off where you've got the Aorus Master, which I, think looks better. It has a better aesthetic. It just looks really cool. I love what they've done with the fin heat sink design and the heat pipe running through that heat sink. It looks absolutely gorgeous. And honestly, they've implemented a VRM solution that could probably power all of the Gold Coast and still be fine. And so it's pretty funny that this one here has a lot more potential for say, if they were gonna introduce a 64 core and you wanted to overclock it, this could definitely do a good job of that, especially if you had some active cooling on it. 
So you've got one that's got more potential, but you've got one board here, the TRX40 Creator, which I feel is a little more practical for someone getting on Zen 2 with Precision Boost Overdrive 2. They've got a good liquid cooler or a massive, massive air cooler. And they're also just locking in, say, 3600 CL16 XMP profiles, which is a great combination for Zen 2 Threadripper in quad channel. And so when it all comes down to it, you've got the Ascetic King, the Aorus Master, which also features a little bit of RGB. It's got a back plate as well, which absorb heat off the back of the motherboard. And then you've got the Creator, which has just gone for pure functionality first and no RGB on board. And I think they've both done a great job. But as I said before, I would be choosing this, especially in the United States coming in cheaper, but I'd probably go for the Aorus Master in Australia offering better value in terms of triple P against the US dollar. But if you've watched this whole review up until this point, you'll probably realize that I'm just nitpicking and I am indeed just nitpicking. Both these boards implement a phenomenal VRM solution, great cooling, it'll handle a 32 core absolutely fine. The chipset heat sinks are implemented with low noise and great cooling. Onboard audio, at least from the rear, is really good on both. The ESS Sabre, I'd like to see it implemented a bit better from Aorus in the future, and I'd like to see them update their website just to fix that download on the 5GBE uh, NIC. And with that aside, everything else is really nice. Do let us know in the comments section below which of these boards would you pick and why? And do keep in mind they are both very expensive. I could literally build a whole system for the cost of these motherboards alone. So do keep that in mind. What you're getting here is pretty much an entry level into Threadripper, and that is pretty much the best of the best if you need the most cores and threads possible on a single socket, or at least a single license for whatever software or Windows 10 Pro or whatever you're using, where you need a single user license and you can get the most out of CPU cores and threads. You're gonna get that with this motherboard and also the 32 core, the 3970X. And both these boards, I believe they'll be geared up towards the uh, 64 cores if AMD is to release those sometime in the next six months. But also I will say one more thing, the Tai Chi, which is about $50 more, does feature more phases than the Creator. So that's maybe something you wish to look for if you wanna go on ASRock's side and go with the Tai Chi and spice things up for bling, but also lose that 10 GB NIC. That is a solution to look at if that's for you. Though before I get on out of here, we got the question of the day, which comes from Rambo Tiki. And they ask, should I get the 2600 or the 3600? They say they're cheapskate and they wanna get the best value possible. And in that case, the 2600 for raw CPU value on its own is going to be better value at its current market prices than the 3600. You can almost get it at half the price than you get a 3600 for. Though that being said, you can get a 3600 and couple it with an A320 and still get Precision Boost Overdrive 2 activated. So you'll be pretty much getting the most out of your 3600 even on an A320 motherboard. As opposed to a 2600, if you wanna get the most out of that, you're most likely going to wanna to get a B450 motherboard and possibly even a better cooler if you wish to overclock it. Another thing about the 3600 is it does have a better IMC too. So it will support those 3200 megahertz profiles on XMP as well as 3600, where you might have problems on the 2600, especially at 3600 XMP profiles. Hope that answered that question. Hope you guys enjoyed today's breakdown of both these motherboards. If you did, then be sure to hit that like button again for us and I'll catch you in another tech video very soon. And if you've watched this far and you're liking the content, you're not subscribed, I'm gonna keep saying it. Sub button's down there, ring the bell. <laughs> <laughs> My voice is gone and I'll catch you in another tech video very soon. Peace out for now. Bye.